All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego and further up the coast off the coast of Washington and Orcas Island is Mike Bosworth. How are you doing, Mike? I'm doing well, John. I'm happy to be here with you. Yeah, and Mike obviously is a well-known um, sales guru, author, speaker, sales philosopher, and story keeper. And we're going to talk today about the power of storytelling in creating connections and trust with prospects and buyers. So, Mike, um, let's dive in. So, you've been talking you've been talking about this for for many many years about yep. storytelling and about building trust and connection. I think that really. Uh, has been accentuated or, or a light shone, shined on over the last year or so as people have been in kind of isolation and all of that. I think there, there is an even greater craving for that kind of connection in all our interactions and not least of those being the sales ones. There is, there was definitely more of a craving in human connect, for human connection for me personally. I mean, <laughs> Thank God for Zoom, I tell you. Um, the old fashioned way of doing this wouldn't have been near as satisfying. At least with Zoom, you can you can read body language, you can let your mirror neurons go to work a little bit for you. Yeah. So so tell me then why 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 storytelling is so important and why it's why it endures in its importance. Well, the reason it endures is uh, two legged creatures who who speak orally have been on this earth for 200,000 years. And for the vast majority of that time, there was no written language. So everything that we learned about tribal knowledge getting passed down from our ancestors was story. And for those 200,000 years, leaders learn to inspire people to do difficult things that need to be done with story. Those are the two big, uh, purposes, passing down tribal knowledge and uh, inspiring people to do difficult things that need to be done. And when human beings anticipate a story, and the real key to using it in the sales world is leveraging the, antis the normal anticipation people have when they anticipate a story, um, you know, with our little kids, you know, once upon a time. And mm -hmm. if you get ready for bed, daddy will tell you a story. We use stories to motivate them to go do what they're supposed to do. And they've, they've actually put people in CAT scan machines in San Diego. This was years ago where they had a human being anticipating a story and they were watching that human being's brain and the critical left brain shut down and the right brain opening up to all their senses and feelings and colors opened up. So there's actually, they can watch neurologically what happens, but uh, yeah, I, people love stories. Yeah, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, I mean, people people love stories. We've got these rich oral traditions, uh, as you said. I mean, studies have been done on on uh, like the impact it has on on brain waves and neural patterns, etc. But in the last while, given this world we live in of of instantaneous and social media and all of that, it's like it seems that people are moving further away from being able to really connect and tell stories because they seem to want to operate in just bite sizes. Yeah, I mean, the attention spans are getting shorter and shorter, which is uh, why we teach people, if they're gonna leverage the power of story, you have to get permission to tell the story. I mean, as a salesperson, even if you have your story down to a real clean, succinct 60 seconds, there are very few strangers that will let, just let you walk up to them and start telling a story and pay any attention to you for 60 seconds. So the real secret to leveraging stories, get permission, which creates the anticipation. So if I was sitting on a plane next to you, John, and I said, John, what are you doing? You said, well, I'm a podcaster. And I say, oh, can I share a quick story with you about another podcaster I know? Mm -hmm. The odds are very high you'd say yes to that story. Absolutely. absolutely. Pure curiosity. And, think... and mm -hmm. in that 10 seconds, you give me permission to tell that story. And you basically granted me 60 seconds. 
And that's how we initiate buy cycles with pure curiosity. Yeah, and and I, and I think that's a great point. But I, I again, I, I just I, I think it's something. I think people need to rediscover their curiosity in many ways because, as I said, I mean we're so used to everything being served up on a plate for us that I think definitely and, and definitely coming out of this pandemic, I think it would serve people really well if they rediscovered that sense of curiosity. So it's a natural thing as opposed to a contrived thing. It's it, it's an unused muscle these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how do um so how once you get, so you get permission to to tell your story, and then obviously your story has to be you know it has to be a well thought out. It has to be something that resonates. You have to be able to deliver it properly. And so, um, do you think that many people actually work on their stories the way they should to make sure that they have all of these elements in it? Absolutely not. Uh, when we when we did workshops and now we do them on Zoom, it, it seems that most people are better storytellers than they even realize. But typically, most of us tell stories in our personal life, and then when we get into our professional life, all of a sudden we haven't figured out how to use stories in our professional life. And so one of the things we first do is we go around and when we have everybody introduce themselves, we say. Tell us the name of a story that you tell in your personal life. And somebody will say, well, every Thanksgiving, I tell the story of John when he was four years old and and da, 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 da. So we all have our little repertoire of stories, but we have 99% of us haven't really codified that. We do it intuitively. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to do something on purpose, to help you sell more, make more friends or whatever, you, you've got to figure out a way to do it on purpose, which means you need some kind of a map or a model or a structure to follow and, and to learn to follow. Yeah, because that's interesting. Uh, the, the That's the unconsciously competent part, you know, where you do things and you're good at it, but you actually don't know why you do it or you haven't codified it like you just said. So I would take a mic that it's really important for, for salespeople to actually look at look at their stories to look at them in the frame and make sure that they're within a framework and again make sure that they have the salient points that they want um, in order because if you do get permission to tell a story it better be a good story well we uh we teach there's three types of stories that can be used as part of your sales strategy one of them is your personal story of why you do what you do people mm -hmm. will be interested in that at some point the story of your organization, why you decided to work for the company you work for. There's one each of those, but the third category we call customer hero stories. And you could have dozens of customer hero stories, which are stories about people that are making money, saving money, achieving goals and solving problems with the help of you or your product or your expertise. And those are the stories that typically we start off with first because professional peer curiosity is a huge emotional need. And the idea is 10 seconds, can I share a story with you about another podcaster? You give me permission. I tell you a 60 second story that's got a setting, it's got a struggle, it's got a turning point and it's got a resolution. And then at the end of 60 seconds, I need to test and see if that story worked. So at the end of 60 seconds, I'd say, well, John, that's enough about me. What's going on with you? And you're, you're going to do one of two things. You're either going to fold your arms and say, what do you want to know? And that means my story didn't work. <laughs> or you're going to start speaking freely, which means that that story defeated your natural discovery resistance. And almost all of us have discovery resistance when we're encountered by salespeople because we've all had experiences where some salesperson made us feel like we were pushed or pressured mm -hmm. into, doing, into doing something we didn't want. And so we've got a natural caution when we sense or smell a salesperson. Mm -hmm. And the other beauty of that story is, is if it's really good and if it's about their peer, 
all of a sudden now, 60 seconds later, gee, it sounds like John understands how hard my job is. And it sounds like he's helped my peer solve a problem I haven't figured out how to solve yet. And I'm going to want to know more. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's really interesting, Mike. And let me just um, ask you two things. So number one, if you get the if you get the latter reaction when the person starts to open up, right, the key then obviously is to, you know, listen and give them the space to talk or whatever, but then to be smart in your probing questions and how how you take it from there. Exactly. And I recommend that most of my clients have their situational experts write those discovery probing questions for the salespeople, because most salespeople don't have enough solution expertise to write their own. Mm -hmm. And then on the on the on the former one, the one where okay, so the story, your first story doesn't land very well, and I cross my arms and I say, okay, that's interesting. What do you do next? I say, well, John, before I leave, there's three other problems we've helped other podcasters solve: problems in area B, area C, and area D. And then I ask you directly, are you curious how we've helped other podcasters solve any of those? three problems. And there's two answers, yes or no. (laughs) And if it's no, thank you for your time. Bad news early is good news. The worst thing you can do in sales is stay too long with somebody who's never going to buy from you. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And I think obviously part of this process as you do it is, I mean, it's not just the story, but it's also the way you make the other person feel like it. Talk to me a little bit about how you can make people feel more comfortable during an interaction like this. Well, one, one way is your own personal vulnerability. You know, just say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having a little rough day today. If you could be patient with me, John, and let me get a couple of sips of coffee. I'm just running a little slow today. So a little personal vulnerability helps. And if I'm telling you a story about your peer, the majority of that story, I want to be about your struggle, parentheses, before you bought my product how you struggled with this and this and this. And that's where you really get people hooked. If, if they say, God, this guy really understands how tough my job is. And, and when you're telling stories, I mean, particularly when you're t- telling them about, as you said, you're telling them about other people you've helped or other companies or whatever it is, uh, sometimes people deliver those stories. And I mean, it's almost like they have the the customer testimonial PDF in front of them and they're just reading off the marketing speak as opposed to making it much more personal because that's what we want really, isn't it? We want to know at the end of the day, we're pretty selfish as people. We want to know that there was another person, another company who does almost the same job as me, who was facing the same kind of issues. He under, they, The person telling the story understands the world that I live in and I can feel it. Um, and then as opposed to just saying, well, we did this for one of your peers, you know, ABC. I know one, one, one of my uh, keynotes a few years ago, I had a big audience of salespeople and they, they had 11 case studies on their website of customer testimonials. None of the salespeople were using them because they were four pages long and stories have to be conversational. And we have our uh, attendees actually use colored index cards, green for the setting, white for the struggle, blue for the vision, and red for the, um, the resolution, and maybe yellow optionally for a moral. And they have to do a makeover. They have to go into that four page case study and pick out two or three bullets for each element of the story and make it conversational with eye contact. The, the real secret to using stories as a salesperson, they have to be conversational. They can't, you can't be reading to somebody. That's, that's like when you watch the news and you can tell they're on a teleprompter, there's mm-hmm. all the emotion goes away. It's just, you know, they're, they're never missing a comma or a period, but there's no feeling because they're reading off a teleprompter. It's the same thing. 
Yeah, and I think it gets back to a point that you made earlier is that uh, this comes naturally enough to most people in their personal lives. Like most people are decent storytellers. I mean, it is, as we said, I mean, it's it's a long historical tradition flowing down through the generations. Um, however, as you said, when they when you get into a professional setting, they tend to lose that part. So how how do you how can you get people to be more kind of natural in their delivery and have more confidence to deliver stories the way they would if they were in a social setting with their friends? Small group practice with an expert coach mm -hmm. role playing. It's much better to practice on your peers with uh, somebody saying, "Ooh, that was a little rough or that was a little long than practicing on real buyers. Don't practice on real buyers. <laughs> practice with your peers with, and get some expert coaching. Yeah, but it's funny, isn't it, Mike, like how often people will sort of uh, skip over that part, right? And just to go, okay, like we're gonna get better at storytelling and here's our stories we're gonna tell. And then they just dive into it um, rather than looking at it as a discrete skill within itself. And as you said, you know, maybe working with somebody like you or, or whatever to actually help you fine tune it. It seems that it's such an important thing that just to leave it to chance or to have it develop organically seems like a bit of a risk. Well, sales is the one highly paid profession I know of where the professionals don't want to practice. If you're a golfer, you practice. If you play basketball, you practice. I mean, if you're a lawyer, you practice your, your closing arguments. But salespeople, you know, they're just in time deal specific learners. And what they, they get out their iPhone at McDonald's. 30 minutes before the call and say, gee, I wonder if we have a story I could tell this guy. They don't like pre-call preparation. They don't like practice. They want to wing it. Yeah, and let's face it. I mean, we know that there's plenty of uh, there's plenty of research out there, and certain some you I mean you've done yourself on that to, to show that it's actually the the opposite is that the preparation uh, is is absolutely critical, and the high highly performing sales organizations and salespeople know all about preparation. Yeah, but they're in the it's, minority. Yeah, and well, it's they, always interesting. Uh, go ahead, sir. One one other big disadvantage on preparation, especially is if you're Irish, because the Irish are so good at storytelling, they never think they have to practice. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. I have to say, yeah, we are, we are, we are great storytellers, or you know, some people may give it another name as well, but uh, we'll leave it with storytellers for now. <laughs> But yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and I think that's where and I think that's the, the constant struggle that you have often with salespeople because they do see themselves a little bit more free form and, you know, want to flex with the situation, which is obviously like every situation is different. But it's a lot easier to flex with the situation if you have a solid foundation of preparation underneath. You, you betcha. Yeah. So, um, so Mike, as, as we as we start to emerge from this pandemic, what is one last piece of advice that you would give to to salespeople as they start to maybe re-engage on a wider, wider level? I would uh, encourage them to do more outbound prospecting on Zoom before they get on an airplane and go pay for a hotel and a meal and all that because. A whole bunch of companies I know in the tech space had great profitability years this last year because they weren't spending any money on airplanes, hotels, meals, and stuff like that. And they realized that they were still able to sell. So yeah, it's, it's wonderful to have a real meeting with a real human being, but boy, get as much as you can done <clears throat> virtually first. Yeah, and I think on top of that, Mike, is like, I mean, sometimes people may say, oh, well, that sounds like it's it suits the selling organization. But the reality is it also it suits it suits many prospects and many customers as well, because, you know, they don't want they don't want to you to arrive on their doorstep. They don't want to have a meet. They want to do this in advance as well and make sure yeah. that there's a there's a real option here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so and I, but I, combination of pandemic and pre-pandemic and pandemic behaviors will optimize. <laughs> yeah, so the so there's a there's a great point to end on, Mike, as you said about practice. So practice your Zoom, practice your Zoom delivery, pra become very very good at it. Practice how to deliver stories, how to look at the camera when you're delivering the story. Mm -hmm. 
and and things like this. There's so many things you can do to make the to, to make the experience more effective. But it comes back to practice. Yeah, which salespeople hate to do. It's, <laughs> it's the nature of the beast. Yeah. Well, listen, Mike, uh, thanks again for, for coming on here. It's always a pleasure to, to see you. Um, all of Mike's information will be below this video. But uh, but before we go, Mike, to uh, do update people about what you're doing these days. We are helping the 80% of humanity. It's not just in sales. It's in all professions. Could be politicians, teachers, whatever. Learn how to build, connect and build trust with strangers because they don't do it naturally. Top 20% mm -hmm. salespeople do it intuitively, but when they get promoted to manager, they crash and burn because you can't teach others to do what you do intuitively. Yeah, no, absolutely. I was saying that's, that, that's that consciously, which is unconsciously competent piece. Yeah. Yeah, it's like that. It's like that. Uh, you know, my son, my son and I, we do martial arts together, and he does that sometimes to me, where he's just uh, when I can't get something or whatever at first time, he just goes, "Look, Dad, it's easy," and he does it. I go, "Yeah, for you, but can you explain to me how you did it?" And then he can't explain to me how he does it. <laughs> yeah, right. well, yeah, he's a kid, but you know, if you're a grown up, if you're a forty year old sales executive, and none of your people are making it, and you're saying, "God, I wish these guys could sell." half as good as I could, yeah. you haven't codified it yet. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Well, listen, Mike, as always, this has been uh, fantastic. Thank you all for listening and watching. And I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.